Tonight on CTV, hear from students living at the best Western University Inn due to overcapacity and information on the monkeypox vaccine now available in Fort Collins. Then, both the city and CSU's campus are expecting to have new major developments and hear about a student whose inspiration is making the flower trial garden look even more spectacular. All that and tonight on CTV. Good evening, Rams. My name is JJ McKenney. And I'm Madison Brummagem. Thank you for tuning in for our first new show of the semester. A gas leak in Durrell Center occurred late last night. The leak resulted in the entire building being evacuated. Students and staff were encouraged to stay away from the building until it's been cleared by first responders. Luckily, no injuries were reported and the leak is resolved as of this morning, September 1st. Now that the school year has begun, first years across campus are busy starting classes, making friends, and adjusting to life in the dorms as they make a new home at CSU. However, the class of 2026 has a few new students who may have given a whole new meaning to the struggles of dorm life on campus. Meet Colorado State's newest residents, the 150 freshmen currently staying at the Fort Collins Best Western Inn. Due to record-breaking in-person attendance, CSU Housing and Dining Services reported more on-campus housing demands and housing shortages. One of the first-year students, Julian Gordon, talks about his surprise upon hearing of his housing situation. And they just told me I was going to be posting the Best Western. I was like, what? The Best Western Hotel? Yeah. I, was kind of, I was kind of disappointed and sad about it at first, but then I came here, I moved in a little bit early, and I got a lay of the land, I kind of liked that. Gordon talked about his experiences living in the Best Western and some of the challenges he faced. Just, just to meet new people, I have to walk out and actually be outside and socialize. I can't just be in my dorm and meet new people because nobody really wants to leave the door open here. It's not like a social area. Other students, like freshman Chris Rodier, talked about feelings of isolation as well. Meeting everyone around here is nice, but there's 150 of, 50 of us here, and once we all know each other, it's, kind of, it's going to be a lot harder to make new friends outside of class and things like that. Despite this, a lot of students like freshman Lexi Himmelwright are optimistic about their unique experience. It's not that bad, and I feel like we're kind of coming together as students living here because we don't have much choice. Overall, the students here at the Best Western have tried to make the best of their time here. Kind of a community being built here in La B-Dub, as we like to call it. So I'm starting to adjust, but it's definitely not a normal freshman year experience. The students were moved to the Best Western University Inn due to renovations made in Westfall Hall. They're expected to be moved out of the Best Western starting October 1st. Fort Collins is spraying for mosquitoes in the south part of town today after high levels of the West Nile virus were found. The, the spraying took place in the areas near Drake and Harmony Roads. The first sign of the virus in Larimer County this year was in late July, and the first hu human case was detected last week. The city already conducted a spray prior to this one on July 28th and planned to spray again on Tuesday, September 6th. City officials recommend that residents of the affected areas are to remain indoors and keep windows closed for 30 to 60 minutes after the spray concludes to ensure minimum pesticide exposure. We are also coming in with breaking news. The Larimer County Department of Health and Environment has reported an in increase of hospitalizations due to the virus. Larimer County is encouraging citizens to avoid being outside during dawn and dusk. Wear clothing that will cover your arms and legs and remove standing water outside your residence and use mosquito repellent. If you are having symptoms such as fever, nausea, vomiting, rash, and aches, they could be related to the West Nile virus. West Nile is not the only virus that's circulating around Fort Collins. Monkeypox has been making headlines across the country as the virus spreads into our local community. Now, with the virus active in northern Colorado, CSU, along with the Larimer Depart Department of Health and Environment, have made vaccines available to the public. The vaccines will be accessible to high-risk cases across the country. This includes anyone 18 years or older who has been in close contact with someone who has had monkeypox in the last 14 days. Members of the LGBTQ plus community who have had multiple sexual partners or have had a recent sexual partner within the last 14 days are also eligible for the vaccine. Monkeypox can manifest in flu-like symptoms like fever, headache, and muscle aches. Due to limited supply, vaccinations, and vaccinations at the CSU and Larimer Health Clinics are handed out based on appointment only. 
Anyone who tested positive for the monkeypox virus is encouraged to self-isolate until symptoms are treated. After a handful envi of environmental law violations the Colorado Air Pollution Control Division says were unaddressed, Prospect Energy's oil and gas Krause site in North Fort Collins has been ordered to seize all operations. On Thursday, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment issued a cease and desist order in accordance to four previous facility citations for breaking environmental law since December 2021. Complaints of strong sulfur smell surrounding the facility have been reported, and a hydrogen sulfide sensor was alarmed during a state visit back in June. After numerous correctional enforcements were proposed to the facility, an inspection on August 11th revealed the oil company failed to co correct compliance violations, and the Kraus site continued to release illegal emissions, ultimately resulting in the shutdown. Fentanyl overdoses continue to rise in Colorado, with Fort Collins being one of the latest cities in the state hit. Now Fort Collins police are increasing their efforts to get the drug off the streets. Police have been working hard for months to get fentanyl pills out of the hands of Coloradans, but have been having trouble handling so many pills across the state border. In response, Fort Collins police have been making arrests of those found with fentanyl in their possession. With fentanyl on the rise, police encourage parents to talk with their children about the dangers of the drug and educate them about only taking medication prescribed to them. The Poudre School District's Board of Education had a meeting this past Friday discussing proposed guidelines for public comment regarding their meetings. However, one proposed guideline caused several community members to express their concerns. If voted, this guideline would have prohibited speakers from making comments on behalf of someone else. Danny Lawrence, a mother of two children in PSD schools, says this rule would not be inclusive to individuals with disabilities and individuals who depend, who depend on other members to refer their comments for them. Concern about how this guideline would impact a teacher's ability to express comments anonymously was also discussed at the Friday meeting. Ultimately, the PSD Board of Education plans to omit the no stand in policy, but the final vote will occur on September 13th. With that, we'll take a short break, and then our very own executive producer, Kenneth Frederick, will, sh will school you with weather. Stay tuned after as well for more sports and news. Dad? Just one minute, okay? Hey, Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Do clouds take naps? I couldn't tell you. Can birds draw pictures? I don't have an answer for that. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! Good evening, Rams. I am Kenneth Frederick, and I will be your weather anchor for tonight. We're going to keep things simple. We're going to start off with current conditions. It's a little bit warm tonight. We've got a temperature of about 91 degrees outside, and it's mostly going to be clear tonight. Winds aren't really going to be pushing in and cooling down temperatures too much. We're only getting about two miles an hour from the north-northwest. Uh, and sunset tonight is only going to be in about 30 minutes at 732. We're going to take a look at tonight's lows, though. And as you can see, it's going to cool down a little bit from where we are in the 90s. You've got Craig at our lowest tonight in 47 degrees. Grand Junction is going to be taking our highest temperature tonight at 66. And out across the front range, you can see that the temperatures are going to be anywhere from the mid to high 50s. And coming towards that I-25 corridor, it's going to heat up just a little bit, getting into the much higher 50s and the very low 60s. But it is also going to warm up tomorrow. We're going to be dipping back into these 90 degree temperatures in most of the front range. 94 in Fort Collins, 93 in Denver. And as you go down to Pueblo, hitting 98. 
Out across the front range, it's going to be mostly in the 90s, and looking out at the mountains, it's going to be everywhere. You've got Telluride down at 76, hitting our low of the day tomorrow, and Grand Junction setting the high of the day at literally 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, no thank you. But looking into tomorrow's forecast, it's going to be 94 like we are seeing on those uh, tomorrow's highs with a low of 58 degrees tomorrow. It's going to be partly cloudy. It'll be our last cloudy day for the next five. Uh, it's going to be a little bit windier tomorrow, hopefully to cool off some students as they're walking around on their last day at campus before this weekend. Uh, it's going to be wind of about 12 miles an hour coming in from the north northeast and sunset is going to be only two minutes earlier tomorrow at 730. And looking out for the rest of the week, as I was talking about earlier, you're going to see tomorrow we have a little bit of cloud coverage, 94 at the high, 58 at the low. But looking out across the rest of the week, you can see that it is going to be 90s all weekend and all through the start of the next week. 90 on Saturday, 94 on Sunday. And if you've got any Labor Day plans, it's going to be a scorcher at 97. And looking out at our lows, obviously we don't have a whole lot of cloud coverage this weekend, but lows are going to be right up next to that 60. We've got 58, 59 on Tuesday, and then Saturday or Sunday and Monday are going to be 60. Well, Rams, that is all the time I have for weather tonight, but be sure to stick around because JJ and Madison have more after the break. Living with someone you don't know on the other side of the wall is hard, especially if you don't know how to be a good roommate. The first thing that you'll want to do to be a good roommate is make sure that you always stay quiet. Be considerate of others when using common spaces and appliances. Hey buddy, what you doing? I'm just gonna need like 40 minutes. Be respectful of your roommate's privacy. Ugh, my bad. Finally, make sure that you clean up after yourself. Oh, a fresh toothbrush. Have you seen my toothbrush? Follow these tips to get along with your roommates and your landlord. Welcome back from the break, Rams. The search for CSU's next president continues, and the Presidential Search Advisory Committee is reaching out to the community for help. The committee leading the search is hosting a series of public listening sessions this week to hear from stakeholders. These stakeholders will talk about the qualities they expect from the next potential president of CSU and what they will bring to Fort Collins. The CSU system also created a survey sent to the CSU community to ask the public about what they want to see in their next leader. The search for the next president of CSU began after the departure of former President Joyce McConnell this past summer and is expected to continue in the next year. Housing in Fort Collins has become quite limited, but this is about to change. The open space next to the Budweiser plant will get a brand new look. The Montava development most recently submitted a proposal for its second phase of development. An additional 246 homes are to be included in their master plan. Fort Collins' largest development in history, Montava, will offer a complete neighborhood community. This development will occupy a thousand acres in northeast Fort Collins, including plans for a variety of housing and community-based amenities. Right now, northeast Fort Collins is pretty disconnected from Old Town and the heart of the community. The whole goal is to create a more blended um, neighborhood where people are able to connect and come together as community. Although the Montava development has plans for energy and conservation efficiency, the City of Fort Collins planning manager, Rebecca Everett, addresses a particular area of review. Colorado is 
a water limited environment to develop in. And so we get a lot of concern and questions about where their water is coming from and if there will be enough water to sustain that level of growth in the community. What I can tell people is that we take that very seriously. We don't allow development to occur if there aren't the proper resources or infrastructure in place. And we always welcome input from the community and we especially welcome input from CSU students who have either grown up in this area or come from other places and bring a lot of energy and fresh ideas. It's really exciting to see a developer come, read our plans, talk to people who live and work in this community, listen, and then come up with a development plan that reflects um, what the community has said that they wanted. As of August 19th, Montava's plan for a non-portable irrigation delivery system, known as raw water, is currently under review. I liked how that development is going to pan out. What do you think it'll be like? I'm just really glad that it looks like we're getting affordable and safe housing in a way that's going to be like more environmentally friendly and more friendly to the people living in that community as well. Absolutely, and just to bring more community towards, toward northeastern Fort Collins will be great to see. Yeah. Well, it seems, that it seems that the Montava development is not the only large construction project in town. Our reporter, Kate Sherman, joins us live in the studio to discuss a new project happening right here on campus. Kate. Thanks, JJ. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room, the construction in the Lori Student Center. The LSC is in the heart of CSU and is one of the most popular areas on campus. So what is the construction all about and when will it be done? CSU is expanding the Lori Student Center, and if you're wondering why, we talked to Tracy Abel about the whole project. One of the um, proponents that pushed this project forward was our Adult Learning Veterans Services Group. Their current space, located in the basement, is very small. It's probably only about 800 square feet, but this last fall they were located in about 2,000 square feet. And this um, renovation will take them to 8,000 square feet. According to Abel, this project will wrap up in May 2023, but will construction continue in the future? This will be the last of a major construction for a while. There will be some minor construction in spaces that would be uh, typically where many of you may not know. It's where the adult learners or learners veterans teaching spaces now, and that um, would be a retail space possibly. Students may be wondering how this new development will affect them. The north end entrance is currently closed and a lot of you are coming through the side doors. That entrance should be opened up by October 1st and then parking opened back up in that parking area. The big question always comes down to finances. The cost of the renovations uh, was split between the student center and also um, adult learning veterans services. So get excited for the new additions coming to the Lori Student Center this spring. I know I'm excited to see what these upgrades will look like. Back to you guys. Thanks, Kate. You know, it's great to see that CSU is always trying ways to expand and create a more welcoming environment for any current or prospective students. That's right, JJ. And speaking of, we have our other reporter, Abby Flores, in the studio to talk about a really exciting program CSU held over the summer. Abby? Thanks, Madison. CSU is home to many first-generation students. With more enrolling, adapting can be difficult. This summer, I checked out Bridge, a program dedicated to helping students make a smoother transition to college life. Coming into college is a life-changing transition, but more so for those who will be the first in their family to receive a bachelor's degree. Colorado State University's Bridge program wants to change that offering a residential summer experience for first-generation freshman students every year. I think it's really crucial, the work that we do with our students. I have, um, in my own experience, talked to a lot of students who did not participate in Bridge, and we have other resources at CSU to help them out and get them connected. However, the benefit of the Bridge Scholars Program is that our students get that time during the summer to start building up all of their resources. They get connected with the library, they get connected with our health network, they get to know what student organizations they can join, what research opportunities these are out there for them um, and that really sets them up so come the fall they already know all of this information and kind of get a head start above all of our other uh, students and feeling that they are welcomed on this campus and ready to succeed. 
In addition to seminars, Bridge Scholars take two classes and are assigned to family groups where mentors lead activities that encourage team building and reflection. Something that has really helped me during the Bridge uh, program has been getting to be with family groups, be in family groups. Uh, it really helps to have someone who's gone through the college experience like lead you and a group of your peers. My family group leader is Joanna, and she's nice, funny, and I think it's been really helpful to like getting us used to and comfortable with being with each other uh, in this new place. It's important that students still have a summer, so the best part of the program is the trip to Mountain Campus. One of the main things that we do at Mountain Campus is share our stories. So really it's something where students learn about vulnerability, something that might be new to them. As they say, once a bridge scholar, always a bridge scholar, and these students will continue to move mountains. I am so happy this program can give students the resources and confidence they need to create an incredible college experience. Back to you guys. Thanks, Abby. No, I'm just so glad that CSU really does do these things for students that come from diverse communities and really give them a chance to connect. Absolutely, and I think we're both first-generation students ourselves, so I loved seeing that the CSU community was able to bring people together just like us. Of course, yeah. And now we toss it over to our future reporter, Zoe Heyman, who has a story that might leave you feeling inspired. Zoe. Thanks, guys. If you have stumbled upon the CSU Instagram page in the last month, you might have seen a post featuring the CSU Flower Gardens. Some go there to study, hang out, and of course, look at the flowers. However, Sam Homan, a senior art student here at CSU, goes to find inspiration for her art. I'm Sam Homan. I'm a fourth year visual art major studying painting. I was inspired to paint the CSU Flower Gardens because the UCA is one of my favorite places on campus and I love the summer in Fort Collins and just how beautiful all the flowers are and over the summer I've really gotten into plain air painting. I had the opportunity to study abroad in Italy this summer. I was in Florence with the art department and there I really fell in love with plain air painting. A lot of the curriculum was a drawing class so it was just painting from life and scenes in Italy, which is the most beautiful place ever. So there's so much inspiration all around you. But that really made me fall in love with being outside and in public and painting public places. And that really inspired me to come back here and try to continue that energy that I found this summer and keep painting places that are more local, like the flower gardens. This is the painting I did of the flower gardens. This is a pastel painting. So this is actually the first time I had really worked with pastels. So they're chalk pastels. Um, pushing myself a little bit out of the comfort zone, but that's a little easier to handle like when you're outside rather than oil painting because you have all the different mediums and materials for that and this I can just take my like chalks out and go wherever. I feel like if I was going to give advice to other aspiring artists it would be to really push yourself out of your comfort zone because I was doing a lot of stuff that I was really comfortable with before and pushing yourself to try new things and try new mediums that you didn't think was something that you would love. It could be like the thing you fall in love with in art. Getting to see Sam's process behind her art was inspiring. If you want to get a closer look at Sam's piece, go check out the CSU Instagram page. Back to you guys. Thanks, Zoe. On that note, Rams, we come to the end of our new segment for you tonight. But don't go away just to let. Leah Kakowski is up next to dive into all the details coming into the upcoming football season. This here on CTV Channel 11. Yeah, we scored going to the playoffs. I can't believe I missed that. Every time I'm buzzed, I spend too much time on my phone. What? I should take your phone away. No, no, no. I'll call for a ride. Hey, why does my face look like that? <laughs> I'm, I'm playing with these new face uh, filters. Okay, you know what? what? Yep, that's mine. I'm going to need that back. No. Nope. Kevin. How's it going, Rams? My name is Leah Kakowski, and welcome to the first ever edition of CAC's Closeout. On this opening night, I'll summarize CSU Volleyball's match against Northern Colorado this past Tuesday. Plus, I'll give you a detailed look into that oh-so-welcoming first game of the year for Rams football. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Leading off, I want to give a brief rundown of the battle that happened earlier this week between CSU and rival rivals just 30 miles down the road, Northern Colorado. As you heard from Mike a couple of days ago, CSU got the upper end of its first UNC opponent, that is of Chapel Hill. 
But what about this time around? Well, unfortunately, not so much. The Bears took the short trip on I-25 expecting to compete, riding a 2-0 start just like CSU. Nothing was to be underestimated on either side as fans from all over northern Colorado gathered into Moby to watch. But the Rams looked like a completely different team from Saturday as they were flat from the first serve and never seemed to find their spark. The Bears set the tone with authority, blowing out the Rams in the first two sets. It was so bad. Colorado State's combined points at that time didn't even meet the 25-point benchmark for a single set win. Thankfully, the Green and Gold did avoid what otherwise would have been an embarrassing sweep, beating the Bears in the third set before falling short in the fourth and final one. I mean, to me, by the end it seemed that the Rams have finally had some momentum going, but it was a little too late. As you can see, UNC dominated the Rams in pretty much every category, as Colorado State just couldn't find its groove. Wow, it was not an easy one to watch to say the least, as we've seen nothing but dominance from these ladies up until this point. But with the bad also comes the good, and one player stood out for the Rams. Six foot three junior Karina Lieber has proven to be a leader, game in and game out. She came home with the most kills for the night at a solid 14, as well as five crucial blocks and an ace. She is also currently tied for the most team kills at a whopping 32 alongside Kennedy Stanford. She has been so fun to watch, and I can't wait to see everything she accomplishes in the upcoming months. Overall, Games like these aren't defining to a season, as it's still extremely early on. In fact, the Rams have a chance to bounce back right away, taking on Arkansas over in Moby as we speak. But moving on, let's get into something that we've all been waiting for. College football is finally back, and Colorado State heads up to the Big House on Saturday for their first game of the 2022 schedule. And in all honesty, it would be an understatement to say that the odds aren't necessarily in CSU's favor, and here's why. In case you weren't already aware, CSU did not have its most stellar season last fall, finishing 3-9 and nine overall and second to last in the Mountain West. Yikes. However, with the new leadership of Jay Norvell and plenty of Nevada transfers, things are looking up for the green and gold. Like Ella mentioned on Tuesday, there are a lot of new guys on this squad that are going to hopefully lead the Rams to success. The throwing game is going to be utilized much more with transfer Clay Millen as quarterback and the ample support around him. But Millen won't have is John Mackey Award winner and now Arizona Cardinals tight end Trey McBride. That spot will now be filled by homegrown redshirt freshman Tanner Arkin. Even so, with all the transfers and better energy in the works, this season is meant to take a step forward from the last. But facing a top program on the road in front of 110,000 plus is not ideal. As we all know, Michigan is an absolute powerhouse in the Big Ten, finishing 12-2 last year, winning the Big Ten, and ranking third nationally just behind Alabama to make an appearance in the CFP. So yeah, to say it's a tough first draw is a complete downplay, as Wolverines enter at number eight nationally. And with that comes elite players. Senior quarterback Cade McNamara is back following a great 2021 campaign in which he threw for over 2,500 passing yards and 15 touchdowns. Primary sources of those targets, including Ronnie Bell and Cornelius Johnson, who are both back stronger than ever. To go along with this, UM has one of the best O-lines in the country, with Ryan Hayes and Trevor Keegan starting at left tackle and left guard respectively. And finally, not to mention a solid tight end duo consisting of Eric All and Luke Schoonmaker. Coach Jim Harbaugh and company have put together a stacked roster, which is why CSU is nearly four touchdown underdogs. But there have been crazier upsets in sports history. And remember, CSU hung in with Iowa last year, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens on Saturday. And with that, Rams, that is all the sports action I have for you tonight here on CAC's Closeout. Be sure to tune in on Tuesday for another edition of Tuesday Night Sports. Stay safe, have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you then.